the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for this evening, for our community, for this time together, and especially this time to be with you as we dive into your word. Lord, we do not uh, read or study scripture just to check a box and to um, cross off something on our Catholic to-do list. We do it because we encounter you there. It helps us to know you, to be in relationship with you. And so we pray, God, tonight that we would encounter you on the words of these pages, that you would challenge and convict us with a, whatever message you have in store for each one of us. You would comfort us in the ways that we are worried or anxious, and that you would give us answers for the questions that we are seeking. We pray above all tonight that we would be open and receptive to your Holy Spirit, how you are speaking to us and leading us. And so we ask, Lord, that you would remove any distractions from our minds and hearts, that any intentions for prayer, any worries that we have, we, we would just lay them at your feet over this next hour and entrust them to you so that we can enter into this time and really be receptive to whatever you have in store. Bless us each here in the ways that we most need it, our families, our friends, those who we keep in prayer and those on our minds today. And we ask that you bless and anoint this time. We pray all of this in your most precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hello, hello. Welcome. Uh, we're in John 10, verses 27 through 30. It's our gospel for this upcoming Sunday. It is a short one. I think we'll read it three times tonight because it is short. Um, and first time through, we're just going to get a sense for what is being said here. So I'm going to paint the scene here because it's not clear what's happening from the context of the, the passage. So uh, John chapter 10, at least this part of John chapter 10, happens during the Feast of Dedication, which we know as the Feast of Hanukkah. Uh, and so during that feast, um, it's winter time, and Jesus has disciples and people he's teaching gathered around him in the temple area in a place called the Portico of Solomon, which is a, this uh, kind of weather-proofed area on the eastern wall side of the temple. So they're right in the temple area, and he's teaching them this kind of long sermon about being the good shepherd who knows his sheep, and then this is part of that uh, particular set of teachings. Uh, he's being challenged here uh, by the Pharisees, by the elders. Um, they're trying to get him to prove that he is the Messiah, and this is part of his response to them. So, John 10, verses 27 through 30, first time through, just uh, pay attention to his response. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can take them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can take them out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Short and sweet, I told you. So the second time through, Begin listening more deeply, hanging on these words. Try to remove from your mind any other image but just the words and the scene that you have in your mind. And see what particular word or phrase stands out to you, resonates with you for whatever reason. doesn't have to have anything to do with the passage, but connects to you, sparks something in you. Pay attention to that. Underline it. Reflect on it. Ask the questions. Why this, Lord? What are you trying to say to me through this particular word or detail? So again, John 10, starting verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can take them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one can take them out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. And one final time as we reflect back on this passage. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can take them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one can take them out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. 
the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So I invite you to take a few moments to reflect on that passage. It may seem very simple, may seem very straightforward, but as we reflect on it, certain things may come out that stand out or that draw your attention. So begin to reflect on those, share those with the people who are around you, as well as any questions that this sparks um, in your own reflection. If you're watching on Zoom, share those things in the chat. And if you're watching this later on YouTube, please do that in the comments. But for those of us here, take about five or ten minutes to share with those around you. All right. I'd love to hear some of your reflections, what things stood out to you, what questions are burning in your hearts from this passage. So what things uh, stood out to you, what questions do you have? Yes, Claire. I like the part where he says that um, he talks in, in the first person saying that no one can take them out of my hand. Mm -hmm. And then talking about the Father, no one can take them out of the Father's hand. Yeah. Um, just, again, the Father and I are one, mm. the conclusion. And I just, you know, it just, just totally supports the, the one God. Mm. Yeah, the unity of Father and Son. I like that phrase, too, no one can take them out of my hand, implying that the biggest risk, in essence, to our salvation is the only person who has the power, which is us to take ourselves out of the Father's hand. We can't simply be snatched or taken away, but we can choose to leave. And he'll let us go. You know, he won't be like, nope, you're not going anywhere, I got you. You know, like, he's got that mark on our soul for baptism, but we can choose to reject that. We can choose to turn away from him. So it puts the power, that free will, the power to choose to love or to respond back in our court. You know, so it's a, a terrifying and beautiful responsibility that we have. I, I thought it was interesting that last week we had, you know, Jesus telling Peter to feed my sheep and take mm -hmm. care of my sheep, and and here he's kind of talking about, you know, his his sheep and how important they are. It's mm -hmm. kind of like a, I, I wish I had a good word to throw out, like juxtaposition. Yeah, that's a great word. It's a GRE <laughs> word right there. <laughs> <laughs> And if you were a Jewish person, I mean, if you know your Old Testament, and you had heard the word shepherd, I mean, you'd probably think of one of two people, which would be who? David. David and? Who's tending sheep when he comes across a mysterious bush? Moses. You know, and they're the two big dogs of the Old Testament besides Elijah. You know, they're the very revered figures, anticipated figures of the Old Testament. So even for the fact that Jesus is using, even though it's a very common job, like he makes a lot of analogies with fishermen and farming and things like that, to invoke that role of shepherd. And right before this, in John 10, I think John 10, where is it? John 10, 11? John 10, my eyes. Yeah, John 10, 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. It's one of those famous I am statements in the Gospel of John. I don't know if we've talked about those before, but um, the phrase I am is a phrase in Hebrew that was part of the name of God. Okay, so back in Exodus chapter 3, like that, what I was just talking about, Moses encounters God at the burning bush, and he tells him to go back to Egypt and to rescue the people, and he says, if I go, who should I say who sent me? And he says, I am who am. He reveals his name. And the translation of that, et ya, asher et ya, in Hebrew, is Yahweh. And it's an unspeakable name. It's very difficult to say. They're all breathing sounds, but it became this name, Yahweh. But no Hebrew people would ever say it. It was so sacred, it was forbidden to say it. it was considered blasphemy. It would be punishable by death. But the only person who could say it was the high priest. And he could only say it once a year on the Day of Atonement, which was a very special day of fasting and atonement to kind of cleanse the people of their sins in a symbolic type of ritual. And yet Jesus says it all over the Gospel of John. Like, it's like ridiculous. That's why everyone's trying to stone him left and right in the Gospel of John, because they're accusing him of blasphemy because he's saying this sacred name. So anytime you see an I am statement, I am the good shepherd, I am the true vine, I am the light of the world, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I am the resurrection and the life, although there's seven of them in the Gospel of John, and they actually all correspond to one of the seven sacraments, which is pretty cool. But they all kind of have that language in, in Greek, echo emi, I am, Yahweh, that forbidden name of God to speak. So that's why after this, where he says, uh, he says that earlier, I am the good shepherd, um, who lays down his life for the sheep. But then when he even hints that he is aligned with the Father in verse 30, the Father and I are one, what does it say in verse 31? The Jews again picked up rocks to stone him. 
Because that closeness that he was claiming, that unity he was claiming with God, was so blasphemous and unheard of that people thought it were, was impossible. It was just someone was speaking crazy and irreverently about God. Uh, and so that being a very important thing that he's invoking, invoking there, and then that image of being a shepherd in line with David, who is the anticipated figure in the line of David that the Messiah would come. Moses saying, a prophet like me will come, one greater than me in Deuteronomy 18, 15. So that is who Jesus is as well. And so Shepherd would have invoked both of those two very important figures. Bruce. So how do I address the Father and the Son by name in some fashion today? Am I prohibited from saying, Father God, I am who I am? Or am I prohibited from saying, Jesus, I am? What should I be saying to them? So it distinguishes them from every other false god in the world and whatever. Sure. Um, that's a great question. Uh, well, first of all, because the name Yahweh is technically unpronounceable, um, no one can really say it. Uh, it's akin to breathing. And so you're saying the name of God 24-7 every time you take a breath, whether you realize it or not. And so um, it's, it's not blasphemous. The only thing that's blasphemous is doing something irreverently or inappropriately. So claiming authority over God, claiming power over God, claiming that God is less than God is, or placing ourselves in a position above God, those things would be blasphemous or considered you know, inappropriate. But how we approach God, um, I would encourage the same thing that Jesus encourages when the disciples ask him, how are we to pray? He says, this is how you are to pray, our Father, Abba, to call God Father. And whatever name you have for Father, in Aramaic, Abba means Daddy. You know, whatever intimate name you use for Dad in certain cultures, they use different things, Papa, Da, da, you know, whatever it might be, that would be a name that would be appropriate to use for Father, or just the name Father. Um, and then Jesus obviously has a name, you know, so just call him Jesus. Um, in our vernacular, is fine. You don't have to use the original language. And um, Holy Spirit, you know, we call the Holy Spirit, so, you know, the Lord knows all languages, but um, God knows when we're addressing him. You know, there's not this, like, meticulous kind of checklist, you know, where we have to say the right thing. It's like, oh, you missed that one word of the Our Father. I guess I'm not going to listen to that prayer. Like, it doesn't have to be that regimented. God knows our hearts. He knows our prayers before we even utter them. Uh, there was one, I think it was St. Andre Bassetti, who said the second we say the words Our Father, the Lord's ear is right in front of our lips. And so addressing him in the ways that are familiar, intimate, relational to us, um, that, would, that would be my recommendation. Yeah. Yes? Can I hog the floor for a couple of minutes? Please. Okay. Two things are bothering me. One was that when Jesus previously was saying to Peter, tend my lambs, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. Mm -hmm. I got to thinking on what tend my sheep is, what it could involve. What occurred to me was uh, healing them if they're sick, mm -hmm. finding them if they're lost, etc. All things we should be imitating Christ in doing. So mm -hmm. we're not just supposed to go share the word with people. That's feeding them. But if they're in trouble, we should help them. If they're hungry, we should feed them, you know, whatever. So it's a, tending is a wider range of help to your fellow man and, and than just feeding. That's one thing. Uh, in regards to what we're reading tonight, it's bothered me. What does the church think in terms of who Christ really came for? John 3, 16, the whole world? Or are those people set aside for Christ by God? What's he here for? Just those of us that got lucky or were blessed and the other ones know because they don't believe? It's very confusing to me. Who's, mm -hmm. who's, who's picked and how are they picked and how does it work? Mm -hmm. God chose to save humankind through the Jewish people. We re reveal that in the Old Testament. That's revealed to us. So they are still the chosen people of God. However, that covenant expands to the entire world through the ministry of Jesus. And then the ministry of the early church is opened up to the Gentiles. We see that very clear in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, chapter 13, and uh, Peter's uh, interactions with Cornelius, and the ministry expanding of St. Paul to the Gentiles. So the answer is yes to both of those. There was a chosen people and that expanded to the entire world. Um, so there are different covenants in the Old Testament, and so you can look at them, is this conditional or unconditional, and is it particular or is it universal? 
So is a particular meaning is just for a small group of people? Is it for everybody? And is there a condition or is there not a condition? And so I, I would argue that the covenant of Jesus, the final covenant in the Eucharist in the Catholic Church, is universal, meaning it's offered to the entire world, but it is conditional, meaning that it is available to everyone, but the condition is you have to receive it, accept it, and respond to it. It's not just like, well, God loves everyone, so it doesn't matter what you do. No, it clearly matters what you do. Jesus says that all over the, the, the scriptures. No one preaches more about hell than Jesus. And even though he is very loving and very generous and gentle, he talks about the consequences of sin and the danger it has in our soul more than anybody else. And he wants us to be free of that. So there is a condition. We just need to respond. And that's the importance of why he uses this analogy of shepherd and sheep. I don't know if anyone's spent a lot of time around sheep or have been to a sheep shearing. I went to a sheep shearing in New Zealand many, many years ago. And it smelled, and it was very dirty and messy, and there's cute lambs there and stuff, but, and, but there's a lot that goes into tending sheep and caring for them. And there was a lot of practices at this time when shepherds would need to, you know, corral their sheep. They were in danger constantly of wild animals. You know, we think, you know, of the old rhymes with, like, wolves, but we see in the Old Testament, like, David had to fight off bears and lions. And so a shepherd, we often see David depicted as this kind of, like, short, runt, kind of fair-skinned, you know, kind of, uh, you know, a skinny little, little, like, person. But I kind of imagine that he would have been, like, kind of ripped with, like, animal scars all over him from, like, fighting off bears. Like, uh, being a shepherd was, like, kind of like an out there type of job. It wasn't safe. Um, and it was something he needed to constantly be battling for the sheep. And that's kind of an image of a shepherd, that Jesus is our shepherd, and then we, by virtue of being baptized, are being called to go shepherd others. And so recognize Jesus protects us from evil. We're called to go protect others from evil. Um, when a sheep would wander off um, and in danger, leaving the rest of the herd behind, uh, a, a shepherd would take his hook, his shepherd's hook, his, like the bishop's crozier, and he would break the sheep's legs. And he would bind them, bind the legs so they would heal, carry the sheep over his shoulders back to the flock and allow those legs to heal as a way to teach the sheep that that is not something that you are able to do. Like, and it speaks to kind of the growing pains we sometimes have in our relationship with God, right? If we're wandering in the wrong path and we're wondering like, why God, like, why is this happening to me? Why is all of this like going wrong? And we have this experience of like a spiritual leg breaking, like we hit rock bottom. We're like, why God, why did you do this? And we don't acknowledge like, well, I was the one wandering off in the first place. But still, even in that moment, when God might be pruning us or convicting us of the things that we've done wrong, he still binds us up. He still puts us over his shoulders. The beautiful image of the good shepherd. One of the oldest depictions of Jesus in art is the image of the good shepherd. Um, the oldest one is uh, one where he's depicted almost like a Roman, uh, a Roman citizen. He's wearing a toga. Jesus is wearing a toga, this very old image of the good shepherd. And he binds us up, puts us on his shoulders, carries us back to the flock, and allows us to be healed and back where we belong. But it doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean it's easy. And so this image of shepherd and sheep would have, have spoken a lot of unspoken things to the people at the time who knew what it took to care for sheep, the mess that shepherd often had to be in, uh, those difficult decisions of having to go off and find that sheep or break its legs or let it go off, fighting off animals, fighting off evil, um, and all those different things. Um, and one other point about shepherds is that um, shepherds used to live um, in kind of common areas, and they would have a common sheepfold. So there was a big gate where all of the sheep from all the different shepherds would all be stored at nighttime. And there was a gate, and there was always a gatekeeper, and the shepherds would kind of uh, rotate being the gatekeeper. And only the shepherds could come in and through the gate, and if you were a robber or a thief or, you know, someone trying to steal a sheep, you were the ones trying to sneak over the gate. And Jesus speaks, you read, read all of chapter 10, you'll see a lot of this imagery in this. But every shepherd had a unique call for their sheep. And when they would call their sheep, only their sheep would have been trained to come out of the sheepfold. Out of like 500 different sheep, only your 30 knew your call, and only they would respond to you and come out when you called them. That's a very common thing to just train your sheep to know that they grew up knowing that call, responding to their family who were in your flock, following you. And so all of that would have been in the minds and ears of the Jewish people hearing this analogy. You know, what voices am I listening to? Who am I following? Am I going the right way? Am I responding to the voice of the shepherd? Or am I too distracted or listening to other voices? All of that would have been front of mind for them. Greg. Uh, there's a couple things. First, I've said 
at what point of Jesus' ministry does this gospel take place? So this is kind of in the middle of his ministry. As I said, it's in the in the feast at the feast of the dedication, which is Hanukkah. It's in winter time, um, and uh, he's in the temple area. Um, he it's towards the end of his ministry in the sense that I think there's one more pass allusions maybe to one more Passover, but yeah, the last Passover in um, John eleven fifty five. Um, so it's in one of the last years of his ministry, and then we have starting in I think John twelve his anointing and his entry into Jerusalem. So in terms of the information we have from the Gospel of John about his ministry, pretty late. But it might have been because of the different feast references, somewhere like right smack dab in the middle. Okay, so my comment then is, since Easter hasn't happened, he says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Mm -hmm. He's not been crucified, he hasn't risen from the dead yet. So is he kind of jumping the gun here a little bit? And, I mean, in one sense, there was a messianic expectation of resurrection. So um, the Pharisees and the other scribes, they believed in resurrection of the dead. They believed that there was resurrection um, at the, at, you know, after, after death. The, the Sadducees did not. That's why they were sad, you see. That's how you remember, that's how you remember the difference. Um, that was the, I didn't make it up. I didn't make it up. I just promulgated to the masses. So, anyways. Um, I did, I did. Um, so there's references to this, like, I think, um, let's see, in Wisdom chapter 3, verse 1, the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, very similar language here, and no torment shall touch them. They seemed, in the view of the foolish, to be dead, and their passing away was thought an affliction, and their going forth from us utter destruction, but they are in peace. So there is this kind of after-death imagery here of something else happening. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32, uh, verse 39 See now that I, I alone am he, and there is no God besides me. It is I who bring both death and life. I who inflict wounds and heal them, and from my hand no one can deliver. So similar allusions to eternal life that were kind of welling up within the, the thought of what the Messiah was going to do or what was going to, to happen when the Messiah came, or, or the Son of Man figure from, from Daniel and from Ezekiel. So that was in the air. So there was an idea of what that might mean. Um, so he's not jumping the gun in terms of the expectations, but he is referencing what he's going to do, you know, in the future. But it's just, it says, I don't say, I will give them. It says, I'm giving them. I give them. I yeah. Give them a chance. Mm -hmm. But it's not. I see what you're saying. Well, if you think of eternal life simply as the resurrection and life after death, then no, that's not happening yet. But is that the only element of eternal life? And that's kind of what he's getting at here, is that, like, what is eternal life? What awaits us in heaven? And that is intimate relationship with God. What is Jesus speaking to here? The sheep who hear my voice, I know them. I know them. And that word for know in Greek, ginosko, is a word, uh, we have this in a lot of different languages. Like in Spanish, uh, the words to know, saber and conocer. You know, there's to, to know, saber means, like, to know a fact. It's the same thing in French, savoir and connaître, same thing in German, Kenan and Wissen, and in Italian, oh my gosh, I'm so glad Roberto's not here, um, sapere e conoscere, these words that mean um, to know a fact or to understand or know someone relationally, meaning to have a relationship with them. And that is the version of the word to know that Jesus is using here, to enter into relationship with. So it's like in, in, in Scripture in the Old Testament, uh, especially when it says, like, Adam knew Eve. Like, that means, like, they had relations. Like, they were married. Like, that's the word that's often used to know. That's not what's being used here. It's not a sexualized version of that. But that's the intimacy of relationship that that word entails. So to know a person, to experience who they are, or to know a place really, really well, and to feel at home there, that is the type of verbiage that's used here. And that is what Jesus says when he's saying, I am offering them eternal life. That is eternal life. It is intimate union and knowing of God in all three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's not simply, I learned a lot of facts about God. I know a lot of information about him. I know what the Bible says. I know where to find this in the catechism or in scripture. I know what the church teaches about X or Y. You know, there are a lot of theologians and experts in theology and religion who do not have a relationship with Jesus. They know Jesus, they saber Jesus, but they do not conocer Jesus. They do not understand him. They do not have a relationship with him. Do you see what I'm getting at here? 
That is the eternal life that's promised to us. That's what he has given them. That's what he is giving them right then, this opportunity to know him right then and there. We, the church teaches that Jesus Christ is the full revelation of God. Everything that they were waiting for from God the Father was right there in the flesh, in the person of Jesus, ready to be received, ready to, ready to be in relationship with them. And what does it say right before this in verse 26? But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. Before that, the works I do, I do in my Father's name, testify to me. They're asking him, prove to us that you're the Messiah. He's saying, I already have. Look at the works that I do. But because you do not believe, you are not part of my sheep. You are not accepting this gift of eternal life I'm giving you right here to know God himself, to know me, to be in relationship with me, here with you in the flesh. That is the, the glimmer of eternal life that Jesus is already giving them here, and it's what awaits us in the resurrection and eternal life after death. Yes? I also got that even if they say they believe, Jesus was saying, you really will not believe. Mm -hmm. And recognize, to your point, what does Jesus say? My sheep hear my voice. I know them. He doesn't say, they know me. He doesn't say, like, they have a conception of being able to understand me. There's a sense that, like, if we listen to God's voice, then we'll be led to a place where we can be known. Where we can be known intimately by God. But that doesn't mean we immediately have this light bulb moment, like, I completely understand Jesus and all the secrets of the universe. Like, no, that's not what happens. It's still like, well, how do I do this church thing? How do I live my faith out? How do I, like, be holy? It's messy and it's hard, and it's hard to navigate and know what to do in certain situations, and we make mistakes and we mess up. But the gift of eternal life is being known by God. Being known by Him. I mean, that is the thing we're really all longing for, right? I can know a ton of people. You know, I can get to know information about them. I can have great, you know, relationships with them. I can go out to dinner and have great friendships and have good, you know, small group, you know, community or whatever it might be. But if I don't feel known, if I don't feel intimately known, then I can still be the loneliest person in the world. And that's a huge problem with things like social media, right? We know so many people. You know, we have all these friends and followers. And we have all these connections. We know what's going on in people's lives. And yet, does anyone really know me. That's the difference. That's the beauty of what's offered to us in a relationship with God, is that he, he is the one who wants to know us. But we, we may not respond, we may not know, we may not understand. And yet, you know, sheep are not very smart. I mean, they're kind of smart, but like, you know, for animals, I guess. But like, there's this evolution in, in scripture of like how we are depicted. And we start as ash, right? And then we move to sheep, and then we become slaves, servants, and then friends, and then like co-workers with God, ministers with him in the vineyard. There's this evolution that happens. And it's a necessary one. We have to understand that, yes, even at the end, even though we are co-creators with God, he's commissioning us, we still are dust, and to dust we shall return. We're still nothing in comparison to him. And yet he chooses us to do this great work and this great ministry. St. Catherine of Siena once asked God in a vision, um, who are you, God, and who am I? And he said, I'm God, you're not. That was his response, four words. I'm God, you're not. This is a great, great answer, and it's the truth. John. Well, if he knows us, and we don't know him, our response is to love him. And I guess that's, even at the last supper, he was explaining the greatest commandment. Love others as you love yourself. Mm -hmm. and, uh, die before them. So I, I guess the challenge, the way I see the challenge is to how do I see Christ in everybody? Yeah. And, and when do I recognize there's a need to love? There's a need to love Christ in my next door neighbor, yeah. my wife, my children, whoever, whoever needs it. Yeah, how do I know and experience and see Christ in others? Yeah. Absolutely. And I don't want to have a mistaken interpretation that we can't know God, like that he's completely unknowable. No, he's revealed himself to us. But the beginning of this relationship is what Jesus is speaking to here. My sheep hear my voice, and what happens first? Once we listen, once we obey, once we're initiated by the Holy Spirit to do that, because God's always the initiator. Once we hear his voice, he knows us. To have that moment where we feel seen, we feel known. 
we feel as though and know that we belong. That's the first thing that happens. And then only out of that relationship can we grow to a place where we feel, even we have an inkling, even though it's an inkling of the reality of everything that we don't know, an inkling of knowing God in return and that back and forth relationship that's available to us. Bruce. A related verse to contemplate in the 14th chapter of John, on the uh, 21st verse, Jesus is talking about his commandments. And he says, whoever has my commandments and, and observes them, and just read them, is the one who loves me. That's a way to love Jesus, to mm -hmm. obey his commands, number one. And whoever loves me, comes back the other way, will be loved by my Father, keep his commands and your love by the Father, and I will love him. So Jesus and the Father love you because you obey the commands, and he's going to reveal himself to you, whatever that means. A deeper relationship, a deeper understanding, uh, closer or something. Yeah. So how, is it, how important is it to obey the commands? And do you know what they are? I did a study on my own. I came up with, in the four Gospels, I came up with 560 commands that I think Jesus made to people. Mm -hmm. Not all heavily spiritual, some of them were. But if you don't read them and know what they are, then how can you obey them? How can you observe them? How can you therefore prove your love to Jesus? Yeah. It's a big responsibility to figure all that stuff out. Yeah, and that word obey, um, obedire, uh, in its original language, in the original language means to hear or to listen. You know, not just to do what you're told, but to actually hear, receive, and listen to it. You know, it makes me think of my kids, you know, like, I love them when they don't listen to me. I love them when they don't listen to me. But when they do listen to me, <laughs> And there's this deeper welling up of pride, and then I can invite them into a deeper understanding of higher responsibilities or the appreciation that I have for them when they do those things out of love for the family, out of love for us by listening to us and bearing that responsibility well. Like that's, it's always comes back to that parent-child relationship and how God is our Father, a loving Father who always loves us as his children. But there's a deeper intimacy and opportunity there and growth in the relationship when we hear and obey, when we listen, out of love, not out of strict obligation, because then that becomes like a, you know, I'm thinking of the guy at the beginning of Sound of Music where he's like whistling for his kids, and it's just like a very regimented, unemotional type of relationship, and then all of a sudden it becomes, throughout the course of the movie, this more loving, you know, family structure. That's really kind of the, the um, journey some people go on. When they see God, they think at first it's just a bunch of rules, you know, and so I just got to come when the whistle blows and I got to stand. Louisa, or whatever, you know, their names are, you know, say my name, and I'm here, I'm going to obey you, God, you know, and then eventually, it's like, no, God is inviting me into intimate knowing, intimate knowing and being known. Other thoughts, questions? No? Awesome. Um, so a couple other things I wanted to point out in this passage. I said that this was at the Feast of the Dedication of Hanukkah. Anyone know where in Scripture we get the original story of the Feast of Hanukkah? Claire? First book of Maccabees. Yes, first book of Maccabees. It's repeated again, I think, in the second book of Maccabees. So the two different versions of the same history from different perspectives. But in Maccabees, um, so a little history lesson for you, um, if you forgot or you never knew. Um, I love history, so this is, I'm going to nerd out for a little bit. But anyways, um, so the Jewish people go into exile. You know, after the, the, the kingdom of David splits up, Jewish people go into exile in Babylon. They're led back home when the Persian Empire takes over. This is about the 5th century BC. And after that, the Greeks take over, and we have Alexander the Great, who I believe we've all heard of. Okay? Alexander the Great has one of the largest empires in the history of mankind. The Macedonian Empire spreads all the, like, all the way to India or China. Like, it's so far east that people were just like, we're tired, let's just go back home. Like, they were just conquering, conquering, conquering. So when Alexander the Great dies, um, in like the third century before Christ, the kingdom is split. And so there's a kingdom that, a big portion of it's called the Seleucid Kingdom. And the Seleucids, there's the Ptolemies and the Seleucids named for different kings um, that were bro the broken up part of the, the, the Hebrew, or the Greek kingdom. So the Seleucids are in power at a particular time in Jerusalem. 
And they're coming in and they're trying to Hellenize the Jewish people, meaning they're trying to make them like Greeks. They're trying to make them worship Greek gods, dress like Greeks, talk like Greeks, like do Greek things. Because at the time, everyone had these beliefs in different gods and goddesses. And if you encountered this people and you conquered them, and they weren't obeying your gods and goddesses, then you had this perception that's going to anger the gods and goddesses, and we're going to uh, have the ramifications. And so there was this kind of pressure to make sure everybody conformed. But the Jewish people, they were, some of them did, a lot of them did try and become like Greeks. They started worshiping false gods and things like that. Uh, but some of them did not want to. And it all escalated into this point where the, the, uh, the king at the time, or the emperor, his name was Antiochus Epiphanes IV. This was in 164-ish BC. And he erects in the temple what's called a desolating abomination. It was a, a, a depiction of Zeus, a Syriac depiction of Zeus uh, that had a, a name like Baal Shemash or something like that. And it was in some writings, uh, some people said that a pig was sacrificed, an unclean animal was sacrificed in the temple to kind of desecrate the temple. This is um, how, how the, the Greeks were trying to just get rid of this Hebrew form of worship and completely desecrate it, kind of make fun of the Jewish form of faith. So this family called the Maccabees, led by Judas Maccabeus, they come in and they retake the temple, this small band of Hebrew people, they fight off uh, the Seleucids, and they camp out in the temple. And they only have enough oil to light their, their lamps for one night, but it lasts for eight nights. And that's why they have the Feast of Hanukkah, it's the festival of lights, it's reminding them of the light in the temple. When they cleansed the temple, they retook it, they rededicated it. And they were able to usher in the Hasmonean dynasty, this dynasty of Hebrew kings, for you know about 75, 100 years, uh, up right before the birth of Jesus, and then the Romans taking over. And so it's a very important thing that happened in the Hebrew history. A lot of them thought like this was going to usher in the Messiah, but finally the kingdom was back. So think of that analogy, that history, and Jesus is now in that same area of the temple, talking to the Pharisees on that same feast of the dedication. Basically, the setting alone implying that the Pharisees are now the ones desecrating what God is asking the Hebrew people to do. They are the ones now committing abomination because they are not listening to the voice of God. They are not responding. Jesus is here. God himself is here, present, the person of Jesus Christ, revealing himself to them. And all they keep doing is they keep asking in verse 24, so the Jews gathered around him and said to him, and remember the Jews in that phrase, the Jews in John, always means the Pharisees and the elders. Said to him, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. They want to know, they keep asking for a description. And Jesus answers them, I told you, and you do not believe. I already told you this. I already revealed this to you. He did that in chapter 8, verse 25. He reveals it to them. The works I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. You are not among my sheep. Imagine these people thinking they're very high and mighty, very hoity-toity in their kind of religious hierarchy. They have this power, influence, and authority, and yet they are not doing what they're supposed to be doing according to Jesus. It's a big temptation for us to be aware of in the church. I think a lot of us don't acknowledge the fact, this has been true in my own life, that many times I can fall into the trap of becoming a modern-day Pharisee. Thinking that I know enough and I'm looking out at everyone else and saying, oh, they're doing this, they shouldn't be doing that. You know, like, that. We, you really, if, if you're going to be Catholic, that means doing this or worshiping like that. You know, or making sure you believe this. You can't you know, abide by that type of lifestyle or support that kind of political party or whatever it might be. And we have a danger of falling into modern-day Pharisaicalism. And Jesus is speaking against that here. He says, if you do that, you are not among my sheep. Because my sheep, they're not looking out and seeing how much better they are than everyone else. They're not looking inward for their own sense of authority. They're listening for my voice. For my voice. And in that listening, I know them. I reveal myself to them. And so that begs the question, how do you and I listen to God's voice? How do we spend time in conversation and relationship with Jesus. That's what prayer is. Okay, prayer is not part of your relationship with God. It is your relationship with God. It is the conversational relationship, just like you have with any other person. The day in, day out, chit chat, catching up on your day, asking for advice, dreaming, visioning, setting goals, planning, the things you run by your family and friends, the advice you seek, the community that you have, those types of conversations 
are the types of conversations that God wants to have with us. And yet, so often in prayer, it's one-sided. We come to God, we say all of our intentions, we do all of our things, we pray our rosary, our divine chap the divine mercy chaplet, and then we hang up the phone and we say goodbye, Jesus, and we give him no chance to respond. So how often are we listening for the voice of God? And there are three ways, generally, that we can listen for God's voice, that we can hear his voice. Okay, and the first is in Scripture. We do that here every Monday night, and I pray you do that even more each and every day, looking at the readings, praying through them, seeing how they speak to you. Not just reading for learning, but reading for conversation and for prayer to encounter Jesus. So scripture is one. Secondly is in silence. In silence. How often do you spend in silence? And not get uncomfortable. How often do we listen and just spend time contemplating with God, being in his presence? So much of what we do in prayer is us leading to a particular place. Okay, we're reflecting on something, we're meditating on something, we're the one in charge, we've set the parameters of our prayer. Contemplative prayer in the Catholic tradition is that God is the one leading and we just sit and receive. How often are you able to do that in silent prayer? In the chapel, out in nature, wherever it may be. It's possible anywhere. That is the type of way we can listen for the voice of God. And the last way is through the voices of others that God has placed in our lives. God is seeking to speak to you. He is speaking to you every single day. There is no mistake that I, Matt Zemanek, was born in this geographic location in Southern California November 7th, 1987, to my particular family, to my particular parents, Stanley and Catherine Zemanek, in Fontana, California. Like, that is not a mistake. That was ordained from the beginning of time that that would happen because I was needed in my particular family, in, my, in this particular moment in salvation history, at this point in my life, at this particular parish, because God knew we would all be here tonight. And the same is true in all of your lives. God knew you would be here tonight. You would have your particular relationships, your particular family, your friendships, wherever you go to school, wherever you work. He knew that you would be there because he needs you there. He needs you there to speak truth, love, goodness, beauty into the lives of others. And the same is true of all the people that surround us. God has placed them there to be a conduit of his grace, to be prophets to us. And I'll tell you, when I'm really listening and when I'm really allowing myself to be humble and not feel like, okay, I know enough, you know, I'm in a position of ministry, the people who speak to me the most, people who God speaks through the most, are the people whose resume looks nothing like a religious person. You know, it's through the person. I, I share this kind of often, but I um, haven't in a while. I once had to do this interview. I think about it all the time. I once had to do this interview for a particular class where I had to find someone who was the like, total opposite of me and talk about their life. So I had a friend who I went through music, uh, music school with um, who was uh, an, an outspoken, out-of-the-closet lesbian. She was African-American female, very left-leaning politically, very outspoken. And I called her on the phone, and I was like, hey, this is what I had to do for this assignment. You were the person I thought of. So gracious, she's an incredible friend still. I have a lot of respect and love for her. And we had a beautiful conversation that lasted for like an hour or two about race and about gender and about sexuality and about religion. And she grew up in a Baptist church, a Baptist tradition. And it was an incredible conversation. I think about it all the time. God spoke to me so profoundly through her so many different times. Like she just dropped truth bombs. And yet, it was in a package that most religious people might think was the least likely or the least trustworthy. That's kind of what I mean. Like, are we willing to be humble enough to expect to encounter God in the voice of other people? That is why hospitality was so important at the time of Jesus and in the Old Testament. Anytime there's a stranger, you know, when there's a stranger knocking at our door, maybe like, you know, when I was growing up or 30, 40, 50 years ago, strangers at your door, oh, sure, what do you need? You need a cup of sugar? Hey, how's it going? Now a stranger knocks at your door, you're like, who's there? What's going on? Turn off the lights. Close the blinds. We're busy. You know, exactly. You know, why is that person turning around in my driveway? That was my dad's thing all the time. Oh my gosh, I can't believe they're turning around and driving. Like, yeah, our driveway's a circle. It's the best possible place to turn around. Like, why are you freaking out, you know? But they, they had this expectation that they were going to encounter God in the other. So when they saw a stranger, it was, come on in. Let me prepare a cake for you. Let me prepare some bread. Let's, you know, uh, kill the fattened calf. Let's have a feast. 
That was the mentality because hospitality was extended to everyone under the expectation that God was going to speak through them. That there was no mistake at this chance meeting. It wasn't chance. It was ordained by God. And we see that all the time in the strangers that come to Abraham and Sarah and tell Abraham that you are going to be with child even though you've been barren for all these years. And all these other instances in scripture. Do we have that mentality, that ability to look out, to hear the voice of God in those three places, in scripture, in silence, and in the voices of others? And do we recognize our responsibility as a voice in other people's lives to speak truth? Because brothers and sisters, Jesus is our shepherd, but because we're baptized into his shepherdhood, if you will, we are called to go out and be shepherds to other people. To gather the sheep that have been lost, to encourage them, to bind them up when they are broken, to go after the one and leave the 99 and help them to know that they are loved and they are known and that they are worthy of God's love. That is our job. That is what it means to be disciples. That commission at the end of Matthew, where Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. That wasn't just for the 12 apostles. That was for all of us. And we do that by being shepherds, by going out and finding the sheep who are lost encouraging them to hear the voice of God through the words that we speak, through invitation, through asking questions, through inviting them into relationship, extending hospitality to them. And I'm harping on this, brothers and sisters, because I know there are people in your lives who God wants to speak to you tonight through and say, that's the person. That's the person. Maybe that person in your family who just gets you, presses your buttons. You know, that like that Uncle Dave, just like always, at every family gathering, like, why do you do that? Why do you believe that? Or whoever it is, you know? Do you have an Uncle Dave? Anyway, never mind. Um, I heard some snicker. I don't, but... Oh, I do, actually. But we call him David, and he's great. Anyway, um, but, like, who is it? You know, in your family or among your friends? The people who you might be most different than, or who you might write off as, like, oh, that person's just not possible, unsavable, that's for somebody else. You know, and, and start looking in your own family. That's the hardest place to evangelize. That's why Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor except in his own native place. Even Jesus couldn't do it. But he tried. He went there. He proclaimed it there first. So are we willing to take that same risk? Are we willing to recognize the responsibility of the places we've been positioned? Are we willing to first hear God's voice, to be filled, because you cannot pour out of an empty cup. We need to be filled first, and then go out to the world and pour that into the lives of other people. That, I think, brothers and sisters, is the message of this passage. To recognize that we are the sheep, but we are also the shepherd. So how do we know that we are being tended, loved, cared for as a sheep by the good shepherd and lean into that relationship, be known and see ourselves as known, but how do we also then extend that to other people? What did Jesus do? He went to the least likely places out in the world where the religious people did not want to go among the prostitutes, the lepers, the tax collectors, and that was where he lived and preached mercy. So what would that look like for us? I have a friend who, he's, he devotes two weeks, two hours every single week, two hours every single week, to go and seek and save the lost. That's what he says. There's two hours every week I go and seek and save the lost. And so he goes to bars, goes to coffee shops, and he just starts conversations with people, and he just preaches the gospel to them. Shares what Jesus has done in his life, and invites them to come and find out the same. And it may not be easy for us to do that same kind of bold gesture, but I just pray, as we kind of close tonight, I really feel like the Holy Spirit convicting all of us. Like, there is a person. You may even already have them in your mind right now. Like, and it's just, we're like, not that person, Matt. Not that person. Stop it. I don't want it to be them. Like, and I want you to know, like, that's the person. Or the thing that you have to do, the truth that you have to share, the person that you've really been trying to, to share with or reconcile with or forgive, whatever it might be, to allow the gospel to be more lived out in our lives and in our relationships. I pray the Holy Spirit convicts you in this moment. Who is that person? Just pops right in your mind. So that you know, like, that, that is what I'm challenged to do as a shepherd, who is also a sheep loved by the good shepherd, but recognizing I have a role and a responsibility. And I don't need to be perfect. I don't need to have all the answers. All I need to know is the good shepherd. And then go out and get more and add them to the flock. And teach them to hear his voice so that they will also be known. And finally feel maybe what they've been looking for for the longest time, to be seen, to be known, and to be loved. That is the gospel. That's what it means to be Christian. That's what it means to evangelize, to be a missionary, all of those things. And that's, I believe, brothers and sisters, what this gospel fights us to this week. So let's pray that we can do that with deeper faith, deeper conviction.
and proclaim the truth boldly, but with love and gentleness and reverence. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, Jesus, you are so good. You are the good shepherd. You seek us out. You are constantly pursuing us. Even when we run away from you, there is no distance that we can run where you cannot find us and where you will not chase us. You respect our free will, Lord. You will not force us, but you will be right there when we are ready to turn around, to seek your voice, to respond. And so we pray, God, that we would continue to respond each and every day to seek out your voice in Scripture, in silence, and in the voices of others, and then to extend our voice our prophetic mission to those in our lives who you've entrusted to us. To call more sheep into the sheepfold so that we might know the beauty and the gift of eternal life that waits us in knowing you and being known. So we pray, God, for a deeper desire to grow in relationship with you this week and actions that allow that to happen. Expand our time in prayer, anoint it, allow it to be effortless, honest, intentional, and vulnerable, so that we would encounter you as ourselves, strip away all of the false ideas of what it is to pray, what it is to do Christian things, and to just come to you as we are, and allow us to be known by you. We pray, Lord, as this uh, gospel sits with us, and as we hear it proclaimed again this Sunday, that new challenges, new words would be written on our hearts, and you'd continue to inspire us to know you more deeply. We pray that you bless us each in the ways that we most need it until we gather once again. And pray in a special way that we uh, that you would bless. And we pray for all of the moms here, all of the moms in our lives as we celebrate Mother's Day this upcoming Sunday. And I pray also in a special way for my wife, whose birthday is this Sunday, and for her parents, whose 40th wedding anniversary is also this Sunday. You would bless our family with abundance, and all of our families, as we celebrate the moms who have done so much and continue to do so much in our lives, who have shepherded us in so many ways. We pray all of this in your most precious name, Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.